Um, but as I mentioned before, I do want to thank you for um, joining us tonight. Um, I am um, I lead the team at the American Institutes for Research in supporting the CS10K community, and we are excited to have a number of learning opportunities just like this one to offer you um, as part of our work in the virtual community space. Um, tonight, I will be here mainly for support, um, so if there's anything that you have questions or concerns about, you're welcome to either send me a direct message, which you can do that by just scrolling over my name, and it should give you an option to send a private chat, um, or you're also welcome to just put it, if there's something general, you can put it in the chat window and I'll take a look there. Um, but hopefully everything should be pretty self-explanatory. Um, as is noted here, we do hope that you will um, call in so that you can actually participate orally with us. You're welcome to chat in the, the window, but we love hearing your voices as well, and Emmanuel will be stopping from time to time so that you can ask questions. One thing we do ask is that if you do call in, we just ask that you make sure to mute your line if you're not speaking so we can cut back on some background noise. But um, I'll be sure to put the conference number in the chat window as well. But for now, um, I do want to just give a brief introduction. Emmanuel is the founder and program director of Bootstrap. He's a former teaching fellow at Citizen Schools and has um, received a number of awards and accolades, including the Alan S. Marks Memorial Prize for Excellence Supporting Undergraduate Education. That's a long title there. Um, but basically, he was a pretty awesome um, professor at Cornell. Um, he, his background is a BS in computer science, as well as an EDD in algebra education from Harvard. So um, we're very excited to have him with us tonight. Um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you, Emmanuel. But as I said, I'll be watching the chat window to see if anyone needs support. So. Thank you all for joining us. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Melissa, for that introduction. Um, I will just do a quick technology check. Can you guys all hear me? Excellent. Okay. Fantastic. So I just want to clarify really quickly. Uh, so I, I appreciate the wonderful introduction. I was actually not a professor at Cornell. That was just um, my, my uh, experiences as uh, uh, the head TA for a programming class there. Um, I should add, my background is also very much as a teacher. So I was a public high school math teacher for a number of years. I also switched over to being a middle school academic coach for a number of years as well. Um, so I view myself as sort of a technology expat who spent the majority of his adult life uh, as a teacher in Boston Public Schools. So um, let's, let's dive in. And being from, a, being from Boston, uh, you should know that that means that I'm totally comfortable with people interrupting me. I don't think it's rude. It's just, you know, being from Boston. So please feel free to ask questions in the middle of this. I'm totally comfortable with that. Um, so, yeah, so uh, as I said, my background is, um, you know, brief life in the technology sector. I went to go work uh, uh, for a large tech company at Redmond after graduation, but then switched gears and became a, uh, a high school teacher working with students, uh, public high school students in Boston. And what I realized at the time was that uh, algebra is very much a filter class, right? It's the class that that separates so many students, that's where a lot, a lot of the achievement gaps happen. And I wanted to look at how programming could be used with my own students um, to help them with algebra. So what began sort of as a curriculum that I used with my students years and years and years ago has now grown into a uh, curriculum that reaches more than 10,000 students every year in more than 17 states and five countries. Um, and uh, we serve students in middle school, high school, and there are actually now, I just learned this about a month ago, apparently there are some community colleges that are looking at using Bootstrap as uh, sort of an algebra intervention for their rising uh, freshmen. So uh, that's sort of the, the scope of things at the moment. Um, I'm going to use this time to talk about just what Bootstrap is and give you a sense for sort of where we come from. And I'm going to do this in three acts. So first, I'm going to talk about why algebra matters. I think that, you know, in the computer science education world, a lot of the time we, we're really excited about teaching kids to code. And we sort of say, yeah, yeah, math is important too, but we don't really focus on exactly why algebra is so important when we start telling people why computer science can help. So we'll start with that. And then I'm going to ask this question of whether or not programming can really help students in algebra. It sounds like the answer must be yes, but it turns out the details are far more complex. And then finally, sort of the least important thing, I'll tell you a little bit about why Bootstrap is different from some of the other programs that are out there and uh, how our approach can be used. So first of all, why algebra, right? Why are we as computer science teachers so, why should we care about algebra? Well, first, obviously we care about abstraction. And Piaget himself actually calls out algebraic functions as being the dividing line between concrete and formal operational thinking. 
So to the extent that we care about our students being able to think abstractly, we need them to be successful in their first year of algebra because that's the first time that every student in the country is going to see formal abstraction. Secondly, algebra is the gateway class for all STEM fields. And I think all of us understand that if a student fails Algebra 1, they're sort of screwed for the M part, right? They're not going to go into calculus. But we often forget that if a student doesn't understand, you know, basic functions, they're not going to model projectile motion in physics, nor are they going to balance chemical equations, think about population growth or rates of change in biology, think about comp compound interest or economic growth models, for whether they're a business school student or going into economics, and they certainly aren't going to go into computer science. So if we care about STEM, well, then we really need to be concerned about how students are doing in Algebra 1, because if they check out of math at that point, they've made a career decision that closes off virtually all STEM fields. But suppose you have a skeptical student who says, hey, man, it's all about the Benjamins, and that's fine, right? But a 2004 study looked at the correlation between the grades students get in high school and their lifetime earnings. And what they found is that the grade a student gets in Algebra 1 is more significantly correlated than any class with the amount of money they're going to make for the rest of their lives. So this is an economic issue. And when you think about the achievement gap, especially when you disaggregate by, uh, by race, this also really becomes an equity issue as well. And then finally, whether you love them or hate them, we live in an era of high-stakes testing and standardized tests. And that means that if we want to get coding into every school, we want to get computer science into these schools, well, that's great. But remember, if a student isn't doing well in their math class, then we have an uphill battle because a principal, a superintendent, and even a parent is going to be saying, look, if my kid doesn't pass the algebra part of the math test, they don't graduate from high school. So it doesn't matter how engaged they are. If they're a high school dropout, they're not going to be successful. So given all of these reasons, and there are many more, we all sort of understand that algebra matters a lot and we should be careful about it. And yet, how do we view algebra as a society? We're, we're terrified. In fact, I can go up to anybody in, on the street and say, hey, I have a quick question for you. A train leaves Chicago at 6 p.m., traveling east at 70 miles an hour. And before I even finish the problem statement, I'm going to see them start to sweat. I'm going to see people start laughing and saying, oh, are you kidding me? Oh, my God, not that again. Right? We have this like, national PTSD when it comes to algebra. So why? Why is algebra so hard, right? To understand that, you've got to take a step backwards and think about what we tell children about math when they're young. So I'd like everyone in the call, put yourselves in the shoes of like a three-year-old or a four-year-old. And when you're three years old, math looks a lot like this, right? An adult comes to us and says, hey, kid, what's four plus two? Right? Or, or they write it on the board and they say, solve the thing in red. So if I were to ask you all, you know, hey, kids, young boys and girls, solve the thing in red, you all might say, oh, the answer is six, right? You might just shout it out, it's six. And if I asked you, well, how did you get that? Well, some of you might hold up two fingers and then four fingers and then say that you counted them. Others might have uh, maybe a different process for doing this. But what we learned when we were three years old is that math is a process. And whatever algorithm you execute to achieve that process, if you're good at math, that means you're good at the process and you got the right number. But if you didn't get the right number, if you said five instead of six, or maybe you said 42 or something, well, well, then now you start to feel bad about yourself. You're thinking, maybe I'm not good at math. Maybe I'm not good at the process. But the important thing to remember is that every three-year-old in the room at this moment all agreed math is a process and their job is to get the right number. And as we got older, this process got more complex. Instead of doing just addition, we also added subtraction, multiplication, division, exponentiation, fractions, order of operations, and everything else. And yet, every single time we were asked to perform a piece of math, our job was the same. Turn the crank, execute the process, and if you're good at math, you get the right answer. And if you're bad at math, the number you come up with is not the right answer. And then as kids get a little bit older, now math looks like this. And let's see if there's any real difference here. So again, I could ask everyone on this call. I could say, hey guys, solve the thing in red. Shout out the answer. Go. And chances are everyone on the call would say it's four, or x equals four. So again, math hasn't really changed. You're still computing a process. It's just now instead of solving for a blank, we're solving for the letter X. So 10 years later, math looks like this, right? So depending on what state you're in, kids are encountering function notation around age 13, sometimes 14. Um, but at this point, generally, kids have been doing math for 10 years. So think about that. How many pieces of math has a child seen before they encounter the thing in red here? It's hundreds of thousands, right? or at least tens of thousands. 
And remember that every step of the way, that kid's been told, your job is to get the answer. So let me ask you, all right, guys, solve the thing in red. Go. What's the answer? You can type it in the chat if you like. Is the answer 5? Is it 17? Maybe it's negative 2? What do you think? What's the answer? Jeannie says multiple answers. No, no, no. Come on. We know what math is. Andrea says it depends on X. What? That's crazy. Your job is to give me a number, right? Just Brittany says it's a line. Sure, we could look at this as a line, but Brittany, I want to know the answer to that line. What's the answer? Is it 7? Is it 0? And you're all probably laughing at me a little bit because you know that what I'm saying is very silly, right? That, that, there is no answer to this because this isn't a question. And that's the trick. That's what makes algebra different than everything a child has seen before. Because if you're that A-plus student who's always good at computing the right number, well, this isn't just a harder process. This isn't any process at all. And if you're a kid who's sitting there thinking that you're bad at getting the answer, maybe you've struggled with the process for all these years, well, now you're in deep trouble because you can't even figure out what the process is. And that's because algebra is the first time that math changes from being solely about a process and now introduces these abstract objects called functions. So this is cognitive challenge number one. This is one reason why students struggle in algebra, because they have to make a massive leap from all the process-based process arithmetic they've seen before into this world of abstract objects. And a math teacher asks questions about these objects, right? Instead of saying compute some number, a math teacher might ask things like, is this function linear or exponential? Is it one-to-one -one or is it on-to? And if you're a student and you think your job is to compute the answer as a number, these questions aren't just hard, they're nonsense. Math didn't just get harder, math has changed. So I'm a big fan of saying that arithmetic is to math as spelling is to journalism, right? If you're a great speller, that doesn't mean you're going to be a good journalist. But if you don't know how to spell, New York Times is not going to hire you. The same is true for math, right? Math is a study of abstraction because algebra is just, the, you know, just the, the start of all of this. Eventually, math becomes about different kinds of abstract objects. We go into derivatives, integrals, manifolds, topologies, forms. All of these are greater abstract objects. Yeah, if you can't do arithmetic, obviously you're not going to succeed in algebra. But being wonderful at computation doesn't mean you're going to succeed either. So challenge number one is getting kids to think about these functions as objects. But it gets worse because these objects are so abstract that we actually can't look at them one-on-one. -on -one. So a math teacher might introduce functions as oh, sound. Can you guys hear me? Did I lose my sound? like other people are hearing me. All right, so maybe one, one person may have lost the sound here. Hopefully it'll come back. Um, so we look, we introduce functions as being symbols in an equation, a line on a graph, a, a discrete table of inputs and outputs, and as a mapping between domain and range. And I know at least one person on, the, on this call said that they had previously taught algebra. So, so at least one person knows that teaching any one of these representations is non-trivial, right? It takes a lot of time to get kids comfortable just with graphing. There's all this vocabulary, all these skills, all these things that you need to learn just to be good at graphing. And then a whole other set of things to, to work fluidly with tables, with function notation, and with a mapping between domain and range. And challenge number two for students is not only that they have to learn all these different representations, but they have to realize that they are connected. And that's not just me saying this, right? Like, this is, this is NCTM has, has been advocating for this. If you're from one of those states that, that is all about Common Core, you know that this is a big part of Common Core. If you're from other states, a lot of standards, right? So Texas, Minnesota, a lot of these standards are talking about multiple representations. So, you know, if you bought my argument that algebra really matters and that it's a problem for all of us, even in the computer science world, then if we care about algebra so much, what does the literature say we have to do if you want to help students out? Well, we need to make these representations of functions concrete, and we need to make them connected, right? If, if we want to make a dent in algebra scores, these are our goalposts. So, act two, can programming help? Well, uh, back in 1970, a mathematician named Seymour Papert published a groundbreaking paper on a language called Logo, um, in which he said that learning to program teaches students a number of fantastic things, and he explicitly called out four things he believed students would learn. One of them was algebra. And since then, we've tried all kinds of programming languages, either explicitly to teach math, right? So um, now we have in a lot of states, if you take a computer science class, you get a math credit. So students are literally told this is math. 
or it's implicit, right? We sort of, we imply to kids, oh, if you like math, well, then you'll be good at programming. And if you like programming, you'll be good at math. And then, you know, we, we sort of pray to the gods of computational thinking and say it's all the same. And we have this idea that programming will help. And now, fast forward to 2016, we have tens of millions of kids in this country who are coming to high school having already learned to code. And as a result, every single one of those 10 million kids is doing great in algebra. And we can end the talk because problem solved, right? Not really. Um, in fact, that didn't materialize. Uh, the, the literature and the evidence that links programming to success in algebra has been largely absent for the last 46 years. So why? And, and this is where we have to talk about a dirty, dirty secret. The world of computer programming is vast, multifaceted, and rich. And it turns out that there's lots of different programming languages out there. Lots of them are good for certain things, and lots of them are good for other things. And depending on what you're trying to do, you want to use the right tool for the job. What if our job was helping students in algebra? Well, it turns out that most of the programming languages that are very popular nowadays for K-12 not only have nothing to do with math, but they are, in fact, math hostile. And I'll give you some examples. So for the math folks on the call, if I were to say 1 over 3 times 3 equals x, what is x? Chances are you would say 1, right? right? 1 over 3 times 3 should be 1. But if, it's, if we're talking about Java, that's not true. If we're talking about Java, it's actually 0. And in fact, it'll be 0, uh, well, maybe if it's not 1 over 3, if, if it's 2 over 3 times 3, well, then it'll be something else. Um, and in fact, for many languages like Scratch, JavaScript, Python, if I change that 3 to be a really, really big number, right, so 1 over, I don't know, 90 million times 90 million, the answer isn't going to be 1 either. It'll be 0 0.999. Now, any fifth grader can tell you that 1 third times 3 is 1. And all of a sudden, what we found is that some of the most popular programming languages out there behave very differently. Why? Well, because these programming languages don't actually have numbers. They have these partial representations of numbers, right? So we can talk about ints and doubles and floats and longs and so on. And if you're in a programming class, that's a really good conversation to have. But if you're in a math class and your, your fifth grader discovers that 1 over 3 times 3 is 0, that's not a good discussion. That's a problem because these languages don't actually have numbers. Here, let me give you a programming example. So folks on the call, you can do this uh, audience participatory. So this is two lines of very simple code. You can type in the answer down below. The first line of code uh, assigns the value 10 to x. And the second line of code adds 2 to x and then stores it back into x. So if I run the program, feel free to type this in. What is the final value of x when the program terminates? What do you think? I see Andrea and Vicky. Yep, a lot, a lot of people voting for 12. So Jeannie, 12, exactly. Exactly, you're all 100% correct. And if this were a programming class, I would say A plus, gold star, welcome to intro programming, right? Of course this is 12, of course. But if you're a math teacher, why does this example make you furious? See, x can't equal x plus 2. In fact, if we subtract x on both sides, Boom, ben, Ben's got it, 0 equals 2. We've just proven that 0 equals 2. So in this second example, we've taken something that is so obvious in programming. It's just so obviously 12. But in a math context, this is like instant IEP, right? Like go to the principal's office, something is really wrong here. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that in programming, we use, things, we use the word variable to describe things that are actually not mathematical variables at all. Instead, they're sort of buckets of memory. And we use the equal sign not to denote equality, but to denote assignment. And assignment doesn't exist at all in math. Gail knows what I'm talking about. This is your worst nightmare, she says. Yeah, absolutely, mine too. So we don't have numbers, we don't have variables, and guess what? We don't have functions either. So here's some JavaScript code. The first line says foo equals zero. So we are initializing a variable called foo to be zero. And then the next three lines of code define a function f of x. Well, that sounds really math-like. So f of x takes in a value, ignores it, and instead it increments the value of foo and returns the new value. Or I guess it's post increment, so it'll return the value foo and then it will increment it. So what that means is when I start the program, foo is set to zero, and then every time I call the function f, foo changes, right? It goes up by one. So it starts at zero, 
then the next time I call it, it's one, the next time I call it, it's two, the next time I call it, it's three, and so on. And so far, this sounds pretty good, right? The problem is, if I evaluate f of five, five times, I'm going to get five different answers because I'm violating the vertical line test. And any, any high school student can tell you that if it violates the vertical line test, f must not be a function. And yet, right there in the language, it says function f of x. So what is this saying? This is saying that in these languages that are very popular right now, they don't have real numbers. They have things they call variables that aren't variables. And they have things they call functions that aren't functions. So look, I don't want anybody to leave here saying, Emmanuel just told me that programming is bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. I think Java is a fantastic language. I think Python is a great language. I think every kid should learn JavaScript and Scratch and, and these fantastic languages. All I'm saying is, if your learning goal is transfer into improved performance in math, then you shouldn't get your hopes up in languages like this. So the good news is there are lots of languages out there that do have numbers and do have variables and do have functions and behave exactly the way that they would in a math class. The problem is not a lot of people teach them in K-12. We do. So now I'm going to talk about why Bootstrap is a little bit different. So first of all, we use an algebraic programming language. And what that means is that our numbers are numbers, our, var our variables are variables, and our functions are functions. Secondly, we teach a structured approach to problem solving. So what do I mean by that? I mean that in the computer science world, we often fool ourselves into thinking that we teach kids problem solving simply because we give them problems to solve. And that, you know, what the research says, that's actually not how it works. You want to give students a structured approach to problem solving, you have to be explicit about it. And so we have an approach to solving programming challenges that looks like this. We focus on multiple representations of functions. We build up from concrete examples to generalized abstractions. We embrace national and state standard best practices for teaching algebra. And every single thing in this, this structured approach applies equally to both programming and math. So if you're a programming teacher, Believe me, it's a lot of fun to teach problem solving when you have a structure to fall back on. And if you're a math teacher, our structure is going to look extremely natural to you. In fact, it's designed on purpose so that math teachers who take our PD can look at this and go, oh my god, this is exactly what I already do with my students' word problems. So it's very natural. Third, it's great when you have an algebra that applies over real numbers. But the nice thing about a programming language is that we can use rich data types. So we're doing algebraic composition, not just on numbers, but on strings and images and Booleans. And in fact, in Bootstrap, kids build a video game of their own design out of purely algebraic concepts. And finally, we take teacher needs very seriously. And what I mean by that is that our curriculum is more than just a really neat software tool plus a couple of activities. When we say curriculum, we're talking about the kind of curriculum that a math teacher might see. And that means everything from lesson plans to standards alignment to warm-up activities, exit slips, full-featured uh, homework assignments, and an integrated student workbook. And a lot of teachers also work with slides, so we provide that too. All of these are things that a working teacher needs. And if you're giving a teacher a curriculum that lacks those, you're making an assumption about how much free time they have to build it themselves. And at Bootstrap, we know that teachers are busy. So what does the mapping between algebra and programming look like? So we teach domain and range in a math class. That's a really important concept. It's like the, the basis of the intro to function machines. Um, in a math class, we have kids write simple examples. So if you have a word problem about Sally selling lemonade for a dollar a glass and having to spend a nickel on lemons and sugar, well, a math teacher won't jump into defining the function. Instead, a math teacher will say, let's do some examples. Let's talk about what happens when Sally has a really bad day and sells no glasses of lemonade. What about when she sells one glass, two glasses, 10 glasses? And then a teacher asks students to generalize into the final definition. And that's what we do here as well. And then finally, in a math class, it's really good to have students present solutions, right, and talk about their solutions to other students. Well, what does this have to do with programming, right? What, what do we as computer science teachers have to benefit from this? Well, domain and range, that's what we call a type specification, right? So you're thinking about your input and output types of your function. That's what math teachers have their students do all the time. Test cases, right, unit tests and example-driven design. These are software engineering concepts that are commonly taught, not in the K-12 region, uh, region, but in upper level software engineering classes in college, right? Because writing unit tests is very important if you want to be a professional. It's just that writing test cases is hard for young kids. Well, it turns out, if you're in a mathematical programming language, testing is easy. 
which means we get unit tests for free in our curriculum. And instead of having to wait until kids are juniors and seniors in college, we can do it with sixth graders in middle school because that's what math teachers already have their kids do. Defining functions? Well, guess what we do in programming? We define functions too, so that transfers perfectly. And presenting solutions is just as important in math as it is in programming. So it's very common, at the, again, the college and professional level, that you stand in front of a room full of your peers and you do a code review. You have to explain your code and answer questions from other engineers or skeptical testers to make sure you've thought through the problem. We do the same thing in Bootstrap. So what do these materials look like? Well, so we have some software. If you have a computer at your school and that computer has a web browser, congratulations, you're already set up to use Bootstrap. We live in the cloud and it's free. All of our lesson plans are incredibly detailed, as well as do nows, exit slips, student handouts, workbooks, and supplemental activities. All of them are freely available on www.bootstrapworld.org right now for anyone who wants to take a look. All of our standards are aligned to national and state standards for mathematics. And that's important, right? Because if you're a superintendent and you're really concerned about equity, and you want to get computer science into the school, here's the problem. If you want to have a computer science elective or after school program for everyone in the country, there's a lot of challenges at stake. First, you have to hire thousands of computer science teachers, and that's going to be a problem that takes 10 years to solve. Second, you need to find room in the schedule for a computer science class. And third, until it's a requirement, you need to convince all of your students to sign up for something optional. And until all three problems are solved, Computer science becomes just a self-selective activity, and the kids who self-select into that class may not be the diverse group of students you really want. But if you're a superintendent and you have a curriculum that aligns with math, well, all of a sudden you have an infrastructure of tens of thousands of math teachers across the country who can integrate this starting tomorrow into their math classes. And once you do that, suddenly computing doesn't become something that you have to opt into. Suddenly it's something that everybody takes because everyone takes math. And finally, we offer support to schools and school districts. There's an online discussion group. It's a fantastic group of teachers. Um, you should totally check it out. Again, it's linked from our website. The discussion about uh, pedagogy is remarkable. It's, it's wonderful to be a part of it. We also, for schools and districts that want support, will offer conference calls and site visits in person with their teachers. So what does the curriculum look like at 10,000 feet? First, the very first thing students do is brainstorm a simple video game. So hypothetically, Let's say Ben and Gail are working together here, and uh, they decide they're going to make an awesome game involving, I don't know, a, a shark traveling through the ocean trying to get candy and trying to avoid, um, I don't know, a, a Nickelback CD that's floating through the ocean. So Gail and Ben, they go home that day excited because they've created a game in their heads, right? It's concrete. They have ownership over it, and it's really engaging. And so we cash in on that engagement by introducing something called the circles of evaluation. And that's this little circle on the left here. The circles of evaluation are a visual spatial metaphor for order of operations, right? It's literally sentence diagramming for arithmetic. You can see, you know, how the function composition works. And if you replace the division and multiplication symbol with letters F and G, this same activity, the circles of evaluation, transitions smoothly into function composition. So that's what we teach kids in the very first unit. Second unit, we extend these circles to cover not just functions over numbers, but over different data types. So instead of you know, 9 divided by 2 times 3, maybe we're, we're taking a, a solid red star and rotating it 45 degrees and then scaling it by 16. Maybe you're finding an image of a shark on the web, flipping it horizontally and scaling it down to the, to the right size. So students are starting to build the images for their game, and now they have different data types. So we have to keep track of all these different functions, what their inputs and outputs are. And that's where we introduce domain and range. Next, we have students define functions of their own. And we do this using a word problem. A rocket blasts off traveling at 7 meters per second. Describe its height as a function of time. And here on the right-hand side, you've got the name, domain, and range of this function. It's called height. We have students create a table of discrete inputs and outputs. Then we ask them, what's the rule? And they generalize that into an abstract function definition. And then that function, when they type it into a computer, they get to actually see the rocket blast off. By the way, if this looks exactly like the kind of thing you would do in an algebra class, it's because that's a real algebra question um, taken off of a standardized test. So now a student, now, now Ben and Gail are sitting there going, all right, this rocket is cool, but what about our shark game, right? What about our game? We came here to make a video game, right? And we say, great, here's another word problem just that describes the candy floating through the ocean or describes the Nickelback CD floating across the ocean. And, and Ben and Gail work together using the same structured approach to problem solving to solve that word problem using multiple representations. And once they type in their answer, boom, 
The Nickelback CD goes across the screen. The candy goes across the screen as well. And when they go off the edge, they never come back. And so Gail stands up and says, hey, wait a second. I, I've played video games. I might not be uh, – this whole programming algebra thing is new to me, but I've played enough video games. I know for a fact that this – my candy, when it goes off the edge of the screen, should come back on the other side. And Ben backs her up. He says, that's right. I, I know from experience how this should work. Once, once they go too far, they should regenerate. And we say, you guys, that's great. When should these ca characters regenerate? And, and Ben and Gail talk about it, and they come back, and they say, well, whenever the, whenever the x-coordinate of my candy is less than zero, you know, if it goes off the edge, then it should come back the other side. We say, fantastic. Let's talk about inequalities in the plane. And so we do this activity using compound inequalities where students have to trap a butterfly in his mom's yard. Um, anyone who's taught math, this is going to look very familiar to you. This is just compound inequalities in the plane. And then the exact same word problem with slightly tweaked numbers becomes the word problem you need to solve to implement boundary detection in your video game. So now this is cool. The candy's floating across the screen and coming back on the other side. The Nickelback album is floating across the screen and coming back on the other side. But now we have another question, right? Now the students are saying, well, what about my shark, right? I want my shark to go up when I hit the up key and down when I hit the down key. How do I do that, right? How can a function have different behaviors? Well, it has different behaviors if you know what, the key, what key was pressed. In fact, this is exactly what we teach in Algebra 2 when we introduce piecewise functions. And so, you know, here's the Algebra 2 representation of that function, right? It's a function with different behaviors over different subdomains. And here's the code for it. And if they look very similar, it's because they are mathematically equivalent. So now we've got the shark moving up and down, the candy's going across the screen, everything's looking good. But now when the shark hits the candy, nothing happens, right? They just pass right through each other. And once again, the students protest. The students say, wait a second, something should happen when they touch each other. I should get points. They should blow up. Something should happen. And we say, great, when should something happen? And they say, well, when the coordinates are close enough so that they're touching. And we say, aha, well, how do you know the distance between two points in the plane? And this is just the Pythagorean theorem. And so we have students do a geometric proof of the theorem using paper and pencil cutouts. And when students have proven the theorem themselves, we say, all right, as a demonstration of mastery, here's another word problem. If you understand the theorem, program it yourself into the game. And then when students are done with that, they have a fully working video game. And a lot of teachers do a video game release party. It's basically a science fair for the math department. And all of a sudden, you've got students showing off their game, hacking code in real time, making customized tweaks for people, um, showing off the work that they've done, showing off everything they've built in their math class. And what I want to point out here is that as you go through this curriculum, we're teaching linear functions, word problems, inequalities in the plane, Pythagorean theorem, piecewise functions, all of this. But the math that's being taught is, oh, did I lose audio again here? Alyssa's typing. Well, hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, I'm fine. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, the, the point here is that uh, the math that's being taught is being taught not just because, oh, we were on Chapter 6 and so now we're teaching Chapter 7. The math is being taught as an answer to a question the student cares about. The kid wants something to happen in their game, and the math becomes a means to an end. It's directly applied. And here's a, some photos of a real party. Um, so this is a video game release party. You've got the student on the left. He's standing in front of his code. He has to defend his decisions. This is a student at a middle school in East Palo Alto. Um, we actually convinced Facebook to let us host the, the launch party there. He's defending his code, not just in front of his peers and his parents. He's defending it in front of engineers from Facebook who were shocked, not only that kids were learning to code, but that we had them do the same kind of code reviews that they have to do as professional engineers. Um, the two young ladies on the right are describing how they use the distance formula along with an inequality to do collision detection, it's a really exciting moment. And as a former math teacher myself, I got to say I was always really jealous of the science teachers because every year they got to show off all the stuff their kids built. And my, when parents came into my room for parent-teacher night, they didn't always have a sense for what students were doing. In this situation, finally I can show off and say algebra is great because it's the moment where kids get to build their own math. And by the way, it looks like an awesome video game. So. Here are two simple games. Um, the one on the top is called Shopping Sensation. I guess it's a, a shopper traveling through a mall trying to get money and trying to avoid the plant from Little Shop of Horrors. Down below is a, a banana wandering through the desert trying to avoid the sun. And it's hard to see in the video conference, but in the background, there's a suntan lotion tree that he's trying to get to to help protect him from the sun's rays. So 
you know, are these games like super awesome 3D virtual reality like integrated things? No, they're incredibly simple games. But you know what's awesome? Students' engagement comes not from the sexiness of the graphics, but from the fact that the kids feel ownership and mastery, that they built something that they can fix and change and customize on the fly. And any of you who have young children, if you've got a six-year-old who just learned to make scrambled eggs, that six-year-old knows that scrambled eggs aren't fancy. But you know what he or she knows? He knows that the eggs are something he or she knows how to make, and that kid is going to want to make scrambled eggs for you all day long, even if it's just toast. The same is true here. We, our benchmark for engagement is whether kids feel confident that they've mastered the algebra. So that's what Bootstrap 1 looks like. And I say Bootstrap 1 because this curriculum is, in fact, only our introductory course. Um, and I've got a question here. It says, the games look great. How do I get to teaching challenges in Code.org, Code Studio, to Google CS First, to Bootstrap? Um, great question, Jeannie. So there's actually a lot of different sequencing options you can do. Um, Bootstrap 1, this algebra-aligned curriculum, is designed as a 20 to 25-hour module. So if you're a programming teacher, you can slot that in after students have outgrown Code.org or after they've outgrown CS First. Basically, when students are tired of blocks, that's a great chance. That's exactly the moment you want to introduce them to Bootstrap. If you're an algebra teacher or someone in your school is an algebra teacher, the 20 hours I've just talked about, 15 of those hours are the hours that math teacher is already spending on the same concept. So if you're a programming teacher, we want 20 hours of your time. If you're a math teacher, we don't want 20. We want five. The other 15 hours are hours you're already spending teaching the same darn stuff. So what does this look like in schools? There are lots of school districts that use Bootstrap as a great way to get every kid programming without having to find room in the budget for a computer science teacher or room in the schedule for a computer science class. Right? They integrate it directly into the math class because for them, it's a great way to get coding for free. But there are other districts, they don't care about the coding. Right? They view Bootstrap strictly as a math intervention. And we've found over the last 10 years of research, we've been able to show statistically significant gains in specific pencil and paper algebra tasks. And you can find them on our website, bootstrapworld.org slash impact. Um, so it can be considered as both a math intervention or a CS intervention, if you like. And hey, if you teach at a school that's fortunate enough to have a full-time CS teacher, well, Bootstrap is a great way to give all the students in that school a double dose of algebra while also learning rigorous computer science. But what happens when kids are done with Bootstrap 1? Well, we have an intermediate curriculum called Bootstrap 2. Bootstrap 2 builds on everything students have learned in Bootstrap 1, and most importantly, everything the teacher has learned teaching Bootstrap 1. And both the teacher and the students can leverage that and add data structures, model view controller architecture, and a Python-like syntax. It's the perfect bridge class if you want to go on to Python or Java. We're also building an APCS principles course. So teachers that are interested in this sort of thing, stay tuned. We'll have something really excited to announce at the end of the year. And finally, Bootstrap itself inherits from a college-level course called Program by Design. This is a university-level curriculum. There's a textbook for it. It's exactly what freshman CS majors take at schools like Northwestern, WPI, Northeastern, and Brown University. So this is college-level material that we've brought down into the middle school. And because we have Program by Design as our roadmap, we know that this thing can go broad and it can also go deep. What does this look like at the district level? So we offer packages for school districts where we'll provide in-person professional development for 50 teachers every year. We provide the student workbooks as well. We include the software and tech support, all the server fees, everything. We do teacher support. We fly back out to those districts to do two additional follow-up days where we bring the teachers back during the school year and debrief what's gone well and what the pain points are. In addition, our staff hangs out for a week in the district visiting the schools sitting in on the classrooms and seeing what the real challenges are on the ground. And hey, we also offer tech support. As a former teacher myself, I know that if something breaks and I don't have someone that I can call in that moment and yell at, I'm hesitant about using it. And so indeed, a school district, if you're a teacher in one of our partner districts, we have complete teacher and tech support for you. So if you want to find out more, what do you do? First, I highly recommend checking out bootstrapworld.org. We give all of our materials away for free. We also have a bunch of workshops coming up. March 17th through the 19th, we'll, our team is going to be in Sunnyvale, California. Thanks to LinkedIn and Palantir, we'll be doing a three-day training for anyone who's interested. Um, there's about four seats left available. And again, you can sign up on our website, bootstrapworld.org slash workshops. Um, if you can't make that, in May, we're going to be doing a workshop in Dallas, Texas, May 14th, and then uh, I believe the 16th and 17th as well. We just literally 10 minutes before I jumped up, oh, it's the same week as Q. Darn it. Well, don't worry, Jeannie. There's other workshops as well. 
I just 10 minutes before starting the call, we just scheduled another workshop in Los Angeles. We're being hosted by the Brentwood School. That's going to be June 20th to the 22nd. And then July 18th through the 22nd, we are honored to be a founding partner of CSPD Week. Bootstrap has teamed up with Exploring Computer Science, APCS Principles, and the National Center for Women in Technology to offer the single largest cross-curricular PD event in CS education history. It's, uh, we're grateful to the support of the Infosys Foundation, um, NCWIT, and the National Science Foundation, who provided the support to make this available. All five days of PD, travel, room, board, everything for all teachers for absolutely free. Um, you need to sign up now because it's, uh, the applications are, uh, are due in the next couple of weeks. The first 80 teachers who sign up for each of these tracks um, uh, are eligible to receive full funding. The strength of the application is based on things like, are you teaching in a high poverty school? Because again, equity is at the basis of all of our mission. Um, do you have a, pr a principal who's willing to write a letter of support? So if you have these things and you want five days of amazing free PD, please come join us at CSPD Week. It's going to be amazing. And again, the details for all of these are available on our website slash workshops. So that's everything. Happy to open it up to questions. Thank you guys so much for listening to me yammer on for the last, the last 40 minutes. Um, and of course, you can follow us on, on social media as well. And uh, please stay in touch. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. That was terrific. Um, as he mentioned, he's more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. So would anyone like to chime in via audio and ask Emmanuel for some follow-up? Or you're welcome to do via chat as well. But if you are um, connected by phone, it would be great to hear your voice. So I'll, uh, this is Gail. Um, I'll ask a question. Hey, Gail. I'm curious. Hi. Um, I'm curious to know, Emmanuel, how you would explain to uh, a district that was interested in um, Bootstrap, CS Principles, and ECS, how they would all fit together in, in an integrated way. That's a really good question. Um, so. I mean, I, and, and Gail, I suspect you're going to have your own, uh, your own answer to this as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, I think APCS principles and AP computer science, I would view those as, as really great goals that we want to get our students to perhaps by the end of four years, right? So if we have students taking their AP courses junior and senior year, that's great. But obviously, we can't mandate an APCS class for every child in a school unless the students all really view themselves as being um, both interested, confident, competent, and viewing computer science is relevant to them. So personally, I view ECS and Bootstrap as being extremely complementary. So you know, for Bootstrap, our focus is very much around making sure this algebra connection is there. Um, and I know that you know, Gail's team with ECS does an unbelievable job dealing with issues of you know, identity, cultural rele relevance, and confidence. Um, and these are issues that, you know, that this isn't something that, that Bootstrap focuses on at all. So students can learn programming in ECS and get a sense for just how important, how, how much their lives and worlds are changed by computer science and identify that computer science is something deeply important to them. At the same time, in their math class, they may be exposed to Bootstrap as you know, a great way of solving word problems and doing better in math. And taken together, I think that they work in concert to build both the confidence and the competence for every student that computer science is something that they can do and that's important to them. And, and at that point, I think that's where it becomes really valuable to talk about APCS principles. But Gail, I would, I would actually love to hear your answer for this as well. Well, it's interesting because I, I, I did put you on the spot there, I know, on purpose. But I was struck by the slide you had um, about problem solving, essentially, right? And the, um, the focus on being able to present your work and being able to talk about the range of possible solutions. And, and these were all things that I did both in math classes when I taught them and in you know, mm. programming classes when I taught them. And I like to think that that kind of trickled over into ECS 
but with a um, with all of the features that go along with ECS that make it a much better course than anything I ever taught back in the old days. Um, but it's that, to me, having reinforcement of those kinds of skills in multiple classes is as important as any particular content that we might ever teach, because I think that just doesn't happen in schools at all. Um, and you know, so to me, they're not conflicting. And I think some people tend to see these things because we've never had multiple courses to choose from before. I think folks tend to say things like, well, what if they learn Scratch in eighth grade? Well, you know, mm -hmm. what if I learned algebra when I was two? Does that mean I'm not supposed to take any more math classes? I mean, it's, it's that notion that these things reinforce each other. And um, the more that we can do to support students in a variety of different ways in their learning, I think, the better. But anyway, that's, that's just curious. I, I totally agree. And, and, and I think it's worth pointing out that um, there's been a lot of friction over the last couple decades between the math community and the computer science community. I think that math teachers jumped into Logo with open arms and then were a little bit disappointed by the lack of results. And, in, and since then, there's been a lot of mutual frustration where the computer science world says, why aren't the math teachers buying in? And the math teachers are saying, why are the computer science people trying to take over what we do? Um, and so there's been this animosity in the past, but I think that what, Gil, I mean, I, I, what I totally agree with Gail on here is that we can bury this hatchet, right? Rather than math being the obstacle to computer science or computer science being the foil to math, when we view them as working in concert, we can do things that none of us could do individually. So um, I, I, Gail, I, I, wish I, had, I wish I had the eloquence of the answer you just gave when I gave you my answer to that question, because I think you're, you're spot on. Um, so other questions that I see have popped up in the text chat here. I, you know, Brittany, I have heard of Elixir. Um, it, it is a functional programming language, so it, is, it definitely fits along sort of the algebra uh, line, but it's not designed for sort of educational context. It's, it's definitely oriented towards building highly scalable professional applications. Um, I would also add that sort of with Bootstrap, we build the whole widget, right? So not only do we design the programming language and have influence over, over the features, but we also design the, the programming tools students are using and the curriculum which means we have opportunities to make sure that the pedagogy we recommend is reinforced by the software, is reinforced by the language, and is reinforced even by the error messages. So um, I, I'll have to check out more about Elixir, but uh, it, it seems extremely cool. Uh, and, and it's great to know and great to see that, that, that functional programming is no longer just this weird thing that no one else has heard of. Um, so thank you for chiming in with another functional programming uh, recommendation. Um, Jeannie, I see you asking if Bootstrap is accessible to middle school students. Absolutely. The sweet spot for Bootstrap 1, we would say, is 8th or ninth graders. And that's, and that's the sweet spot. There's tons of middle schools that use Bootstrap with 7th graders as a way of, of getting them prepared for their rigorous Algebra 1. Um, it's also used with 6th graders. In fact, there's a school district in Maryland. A number of their schools use Bootstrap with their gifted 5th graders as a way of uh, priming the pump for rigorous algebra they're going to take in 6th grade. Likewise. Bootstrap is used as a remediation program. Let's all be honest. We know juniors and seniors out there who cognitively could totally do algebra, but they've been burned so many times before that the moment they hear a train leaving Chicago, they freak out. So Bootstrap can be used in multiple contexts. And you can just tell those older kids, hey, forget about, program, forget about math. This isn't a math class. We're all here to make a video game. And then with a nod and a wink, you get started. So it's designed to be flexible for both. I would say 50% of our students are in middle school, 50% are in high school, give or take maybe 5, five or 10% of error. Yeah, it, it does take a little bit of time. Um, I think something that math teachers are, are very quick to, to jump on is that the, that the pedagogy is so important. 
I think a lot of folks who come to Bootstrap from the programming world, they focus so heavily on the programming that, and they, they view the pedagogy as this sort of heavyweight weird thing on the side that they can skip over. Um, all I can say is it's totally worth the time and I cannot recommend coming to PD enough. Uh, the PD is really, really fun. We model the entire curriculum and after each section we take a break and ask, you know, why did the teachers think we did it this way? How might we change it? How might we differentiate it? Um, the training is really, really fun, and we, we work hard to make sure it's affordable. Oh, you were in, oh, of course, Digital Educator Day. Well, Jeannie, don't worry. If you can, if you can join us at the, Brent, at the Brentwood School on June 20th to the 22nd, we would love to have you. And if you can't make that, um, CSPD week is going to be a blast. Come hang out with, with, with myself, with Gail, with Owen, with Joanna. Um, it's going to be really, really fun. and asks, what would you recommend for 11th graders who don't need remediation? Should they start with Bootstrap 1 and go fast to get to Bootstrap 2, or is Bootstrap not appropriate for 11th graders? Ah, interesting question. So I would, I would basically say start with Bootstrap 1 and go fast, because what students are going to learn in Bootstrap 1 that they haven't seen, even if they're perfectly comfortable with algebra, is both the programming language and the structured approach to problem solving. And both of those Bootstrap 2 takes for granted, right? Bootstrap 2 assumes kids are masters of both of them. So if students are already super solid with the algebra, I would say they can blast through Bootstrap 1 in a significantly shorter amount of time. Um, I believe that it's quite possible that an 11th grade teacher could knit the two of them together, teach Bootstrap 1 very quickly, and then go deep in Bootstrap 2, and build a semester-long programming class out of it if they chose. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, so Jeannie, I'll be honest, I haven't been to a CSTEM training, so I can't speak from experience, but my understanding is that CSTEM is very much focused on sort of doing math-like things in a C++ environment. And so C++ is a really powerful programming language that isn't designed around the math connection. So it, you know, it, for example, it doesn't have numbers, it doesn't have variables, it doesn't have functions, at least not in the sense that a, a math student would be encountering in a math class. So I think that if, you're, if your end goal is that students have to learn C++ and you want to make sure that the kinds of things they're doing with C++ are as mathy as possible, I think that the CSTEM materials that I've seen um, seem to have a lot of, a lot of good stuff there. Um, but again, you know, having not been to a CSTEM workshop, I, I can't speak from experience. And Gail, I, I totally agree with you. For 11th graders, changing the problem context is probably a really good idea, especially for, for 11th graders. Jason asks, any advice or warnings for trying to do Bootstrap 1 at the end of the year in Algebra 1? So that's a really good question. Um, I think my, the advantage of doing Bootstrap 1 at the end, right, so like after the state tests, after the finals, the advantage of that is it makes your planning a lot easier as a teacher, right, because integration takes a lot more upfront planning. So that's one, that's one argument for, for doing that. Another argument for doing that is that if you're doing it at the end of the year, you can do Bootstrap every single day, right? Just Monday through Friday, you're just doing it in every consecutive period, which means you can move through the material a whole lot faster. You're not having to worry about, uh, you know, retention and bringing kids back to what they did last week. Um, so it goes very quickly. Um, and the, the third argument to do it at the end of the year is you can use it to, rev to, to link back to what you've shown them during the year. So as they're solving problems in Bootstrap 1, you know, let's say a student is saying, uh, I want my candy to come back on the screen. You can say, hey, remember what we did with uh, inequalities in the plane. And so it's a really nice way as like a capstone project of reminding students just how much they've learned during the year and why it's applicable. Here's the warning. Here's the downside of doing it at the end of the year. 
The downside is if students wind up having a lot of aha moments, right? If there are certain concepts that they were struggling with and when they finally see it applied in Bootstrap 1, they go, oh, it's, you know, that's what it is. Then, it, you know, it may be that you're like, oh, man, I wish they had, I wish they had that experience earlier. But for a first-time Bootstrap teacher who's sort of dipping his toe in the water, who, who wants to be conservative and just sort of test it out, I think doing it at the end of the year is a fantastic idea. And if you feel good about it and if the results are positive, instead you may decide that for the following year you want to do it at the beginning of the year or that you want to do the, spend your summer doing some planning time to think about how to sprinkle it throughout the year so it's tightly integrated. So students are doing the same concept in Bootstrap that they're doing in their math book um, and they're much more likely to draw connections. Viola says, I work at a continuation high school, so Bootstrap would be ideal for my 11th graders. Oh, fantastic. Um, Viola, you, you you use the word continuation school, and not every state uses that. Uh, you wouldn't happen to be in California, would you? Aha. Okay, so we actually, um, the Ralph J. Bunch Continuation School in Oakland has actually used Bootstrap um, as a remediation for their 11th and 12th graders to get them to pass algebra. Um, and they've had a lot of really good success there. I would say, um, based on their experience, and I'm happy to connect you with some of the teachers who, who've used it, um, I would recommend giving yourself more than the standard 20 to 25 hours. I might give yourself 30 hours, just a little bit of extra wiggle room to go deeper on some of the concepts. Um, so ha happy to talk more with you about that offline. But yeah, I, I think you might want to be a little bit more conservative with timing, especially your first time through. Last call for any final questions. I'm sure Emmanuel will be happy to connect with you afterwards as well. Um, through a variety of means, but anything before we close out for the evening? Looks like a couple of folks are typing. Melissa, at the, uh, at the middle of the hour, do, does this chat automatically end and we turn into pumpkins? We do not. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to log off pretty shortly thereafter, though, because I have another call. Sure. All right. So it looks like we've got about two minutes left on the clock. I'll answer as many questions as I can if, uh, if they get typed in. Um, Jeannie says, I haven't been trained in CSTEM either, but I attended a two-week Alice training. Alex, Alice also very tightly linked to math. Excellent. Uh, was that by any chance at uh, Steve Cooper's training um, over at Stanford? Um, in any case, yeah, there you go. Yeah, he does a, he does a really nice job. Um, if, you can, you know, if you can make it to our training, I think it would be really nice to, to bring the context of your prior experiences into it. It will give you a chance to mix and match and sort of see how, they, how these things complement each other. And uh, we would have a blast, and we'd, we'd love to work with you. The Alice training. Yeah, well, I, I know Alice is a very complex environment, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's got inheritance built in. There are some pretty high-level concepts. Um, again, I think it, it reminds me a lot of CSTEM in that it's a computer science class that's bending over backwards to bring in some math stuff. Um, Bootstrap comes from a very different angle. So our, our goal is it's, a, you know, it's, a math, yeah, it's much more accessible to a math teacher. It's a math class that happens to use programming um, to build something kids love and are, and are excited about. So in our experience, math teachers are, are, they pick it up very quickly. You can look at our website again, bootstrapworld.org slash impact. You'll see that the overwhelming majority of teachers who are using Bootstrap are actually non-CS teachers. Um, I think it's something like 60% of them are, uh, are algebra or pre-algebra teachers. Another 10% are neither math nor computing teachers. So it's a very gentle introduction. Math teachers feel right at home. So I know that we're at the top of the hour, so I'll pass this back to Melissa. Thank you all so much for being here. Gail, it was an honor to be on this, the same call as you, and I'm really excited to, uh, to be at CSPD Week with you. I think we're going to have a great time. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. We certainly do appreciate it. Um, just a few wrap-up next steps. We hope that if you are not already a member of the CSNK community that you will um, consider joining. I'll put the link in the uh, chat window there so you'll have that easily accessed as well. Um, I'm guessing that many of you may follow us on Twitter, but if you don't, just a, just a FYI, we do have um, our Twitter, Twitter chats on the fourth Monday of each month. Um, we've moved our start time back an hour, so it's a little bit later. It's 6 um, Pacific, 9 Eastern, um, and our next chat will be on March the 28th. 
Um, and we have a couple of webinars that are going to be coming up soon. March 22nd, um, Gail Chapman is going to be doing another one on ECS and broadening participation. Um, and then end of March, I think we've almost solidified it on the 29th, um, Lynn Diaz from the College Board is going to be doing an update about um, CSP and some, some critical things that she's going to be sharing with you all. So um, again, we hope that you will stay connected with us, um, and we're glad you're here. We hope to see you on another webinar very soon. So thank you again, Emmanuel, and um, I hope everyone has a great evening. Good night.